So my whole thing is how do you prevent and reduce active shooters? So I can tell you a little about me, which you probably know already, that uh, I sort of grew into this working with the Defense Department. And I've worked in all these different places and especially uh, really liked uh, healthcare and the things that we were doing in hospitals at that time when I got into this, which was 20, 25 years ago. And so I've taken every, I'm certified in Homeland Security, anti-terrorism and everything else because I probably did to every conference of ASIS for the last 20 years and probably IAHSS for the last 10 years. And I've done such interesting things as deciding, uh, designing courthouses so that the guy who, uh, the judge who awards the wife, you know, $20,000, $30,000 a month for the rest of her life, then has to go to the bathroom. So it goes in the courthouse bathroom where the husband who's going to have to pay all that's there. And I don't have to tell you how ugly that can get. But everything from that to, to how to prevent pediatric medication errors, doing the work and actually cre creating a software program and much easier make the dosage work for smaller and you know younger patients. I wrote the model for court for Coast Guard for court, or port security after 9-11. I did uh, different assessment models for the Department of Interior on how to assess the terrorist quotient for the 97,000 dams in the United States. That's how many dams, natural and man-made. Obviously, most of those are natural dams, but they're all, they're all correlated, they're all examined, and they're all safe now. You'd be happy to know. And so what I do mostly is I work with, uh, with companies. I do go out and I do their risk assessments, mostly hospitals, but also casinos, anybody who has a high-value target, and we'll just we'll get into that in a second. So these are just some of the things that happened lately. This, I'm sure you all heard about this. This was a week and a, two weeks ago. A gunman armed with a rifle and multiple magazines of ammo killed three people and injured two others at an Indiana shopping mall in the food court before he was shot and killed by a 22 year old. So uh, the guy had his own gun with him. They were in the food court and the guy started shooting and the guy just took his gun out without hesitation and uh, took care of those people. So that, that was a good thing in this case. So this is the one we're gonna dig into a little because this is gonna help you when you talk to your management. And so this is a real extreme example. And this is right outside of St. Louis. And this was where a nurse and a paramedic were stabbed and left with serious injuries at SSM Health, DePaul Hospital, DePaul University. Uh, nurses said that the hospital leaders had repeatedly ignored their pleas to increase security at the hospital, including they requested more security staff. They wanted to add concealed weapons detectors, and they wanted to prevent workplace violence incidents. And so as a 30-year-old woman, just uh, she walked right in the hospital because they didn't have any detectors or anything with her giant knife and just started stabbing people. One of the witnesses say, I heard somebody say she had a knife, so I looked up and I saw the woman. She was stabbing the nurse and everybody, all the workers, they all rushed over to her, all the paramedics and everybody to stop her. And the knife was just going everywhere. So the nurses said that for years, they've asked hospital administrators to add more security guards and metal detectors. Nurses said they were not surprised when they heard about the stabbings. They said there were frequent incidents of patients physically and verbally assaulting employees, according to the report. SSM had all the warnings they could possibly need. This was 100% preventable, said one SSM nurse who no longer works at the hospital. In fact, what's so funny is that she actually, one of the workers at the hospital has already migrated to one of my clients that I work real closely with. And he said, I, so he got this in the, on the same way that you do on the risk alerts. And he called me up to tell me that one of the people left that because they didn't have any security. And he's been working up there with uh, this, my client for quite, quite a bit of time. And so that was, I thought, sort of interesting. And it's ironic that the staff members down here, the lessons learned, don't wait to add the security controls, add them first. In fact, a lot of the things that we look at and you see about people, they write these long scholarly articles about what motivates an active shooter and for the time they spin on it, they could actually put in a control that would prevent the active shooter from shooting somebody, but they don't think that way. So, but I'm getting more and more militant as I get older. 
It was ironic that the staff members who had requested more security on site and more concealed metal detectors were the ones who were attacked. Like, when does that happen? It's almost like karma, you know? So this is an article that was in the, in the St. Louis Business Journal the next week. SSM Health DePaul Hospital has increased security in its emergency department. What a surprise. One week after a nurse and a paramedic were stabbed by a 30-year-old woman. In the statement, Brian Perkins, a spokesman for SSM Health DePaul, said a security guard had been contacted to, to, to be contracted to, to be in the emergency department 724. So a metal detector was also added to the emergency department, just like they requested. It's the sixth hospital in the St. Louis area to add a metal detector in the emergency department. And four of those hospitals, <coughs> excuse me, are part of the SSM system. And he made it, sound, it was funny because he made it sound like they'd been reviewing it for a long time. He said the hospital spent several months conducting an extensive system-wide evaluation of our physical environments while also seeking input from team members who participate in our workplace violence committees at the local and system level. And he also said that they were going to get guards and the guards were going to, uh, the guards were going to uh, get more education and training and that was going to help uh, eliminate the problem that they had. Not, not that there was a stabbing there. So the other two things I wanted to share with you, these are the active shooter incidents in the United States in 2021. And if you're interested in this, I'll be happy to send it to you when I write you a note after this and send you your video. But basically, it compares 2020 with 2021. It came out in May, end of May. So look at total active shooter incidents. We had 40 in 19 states in 2020. In 2021, we had 60 in 30 states, 61 in 30 states. How many casualties? 164 in 2020, 38 killed, 126 wounded. How many in 2021? Look how much it went up to 243. Uh, this was in May, by May, 103 killed and 140 wounded. Only one law enforcement officer was killed in 2020, two in 2021. How many law enforcement officers wounded? 11 in 2020, five in 2021. What incidents met the mass shooting definition? Five in 2020, 12 in 2021. How many incidents did law enforcement engage a shooter? Eight in 2020, 17 in 2021. What were the gender of the shooters in the, they had out of 42 shooters, 35 were male, three were female and four they weren't sure about. And in 2021, there were 61 shooters, 60 were male and only one female. And then uh, only one wore body armor in 2020, two in 2021. The shooters committed suicide seven in 2020 and 11 in 2021. And the, I've done a correlation on this myself. And the younger they are, the less likely they are to commit suicide. It's the older ones over 50 who always commit suicide. In fact, we had, as we'll talk about in a minute, we had one of the uh, groundbreaking things. We had an active shooter who was 71 years old and he committed suicide. He was the oldest active shooter on record. How many shooters killed by law enforcement? Uh, four in 2020, 14 in 2021. How many were killed by the, uh, killed by the local a citizen? two in 2020 and four in 2021. So now we'll have to see. So what happens now? So what I wanted to show you too was this just came out today. I got this today from the Justice Department. It's a study of pre-attack behaviors from active shooters in the United States. And it took a big chunk of uh, uh, time, 2000, year 2000 to 2013. So this was a phase two of this study. And so it's, I'm just gonna summarize this for you. Six, 63 active shooters didn't, weren't uniform in any way. Said they, they couldn't be based on demographics alone. So there was no way to say olders or more older than younger or anything like that. Said they, take, they, took, they an, examined the time it takes to plan and prepare for an attack. 77% of these subjects spent a week or longer on their attack and 46% spend a week or longer preparing, like buying the guns and things like that. A majority of the active shooters had their firearms legally with only a very small percentage illegal firearms. There's so many guns around now that it, it, having it, whether it's legal or not, really doesn't make any difference. They all come from the same place, you know. 
the FBI could verify that only 25% of active shooters had ever been diagnosed with a mental illness. And of those diagnosed, only three had like a psychotic disorder. So I think that's something else that people get wrong too. They think that if you're going to shoot somebody, something's wrong with you, but apparently at least you're not diagnosed as that. That active shooters were experiencing multiple stressors usually, an average of 3.6 separate stressors in the year before they were attacked. On average, on average, each active shooter displayed four to five concerning behaviors over time that were observable to those people around the shooter, which that's just the part I thought was the most interesting. And for active shooter under age 18, school peers and teacher were more likely to observe the behavior than the family members. The family members just like didn't even see it, you know? This is the age of the shooters and over the demographics. So 13% were 12 to 17, 25% 18 to 19, 18 to 29. 9%, 30 to 39. And so it's right in here is that these three areas here, uh, almost a third of them were 40 to 49. And then it starts to go down again. So 13% were 50 to 59, 9% were 60 to 69, and only two were 70 or more. And that shooter we had in Alabama, he was the oldest active shooter at 71. So this is a concerning behavior. So there's two tables here, continues on the next page. The first was mental health and 62, or I'm sorry, mental health, the concerning behavior of mental health had 39 people that they, in the study that they used that exhibited that. And that was 61% of the whole. And it had problems with personal relations, 36 exhibited that, 57% of the whole. Leakage, 35% uh, leakage of the information that they were going to do it going out, 35%, 56% of the whole. Quality of thinking or communication, 35%, 54% of the whole work performance concerning behavior was at 11, exhibited that, which was 46% of the whole. School performance, five people uh, exhibited that. Threats and confrontations, 22% saw that. Uh, anger, 21%. Physical aggression, 21%. And they go to the next page. Risk taking. So 13% exhibited that. Firearm behavior, 13% exhibited that. Violent media usage, having on their computers that they found later, 12%, 12 people. Uh, eat, weight and eating disorders, eight, eight people. Drug abuse, only eight. You'd think that most of these people would have a drug abuse problem, but they didn't. Impulsivity, a seven. Alcohol abuse, six. Physical health, six. Other like idle, Ideal, idealizing criminals and other active shooters, five. Sexual behavior, four. Quality of sleep, three. And hygiene and appearance, only two exhibited a problem with that. So, uh, so that's good. And there's a lot more, but I'm going to send you the whole the link to it. So if you want to look it up and see it, you can. You could read the whole thing. So again, we're here because workplace violence and healthcare isn't slowing down and it's still occurring more frequently today than it did in the last 20 years. And so we're gonna have to do something to slow these rates down. So what can we do? And uh, how common is it? OSHA said it's more dangerous or how dangerous it is to be in healthcare. OSHA said in one of their publications, it's more dangerous to be in healthcare than to work up on a, you know, high-rise building, like a 17-story building. And seven of 10 physicians from the Emergency College of Emergency Physi American College of Emergency Physicians, they're concerned about it too. And they said that they think it definitely affects patient care. So that's not very good. So, so here's my whole point is why is this still happening? Because this has been going on since Columbine. That must be like 25 years ago. Why is it still happening? And why is it increasing again? That's what frightens me. And so these are what some of the conclusions I came to. And if you disagree, please write me a note and tell me. We, I call you and talk about it. But security is still an afterthought in most places. In fact, a lot of people don't even think of security as something that has to do with facilities or uh, you know hardwired security controls or anything like that. You say security to most people, they think you're talking about IT security. So that's actually part of number four down here. 
uh, security is still an expense item on a balance sheet. And that's the other reason people don't like it, especially in hospitals. They don't want any, any expense items on the balance sheet. And the, other, the third thing that I've thought is that security still follows a law enforcement model. And a law enforcement model is completely different than security. So a law, a law enforcement model, at least in most cases, you go in and disarm the person, right? And then you, you, get, you, you get them to court and you sentence them. That's what happens. The jo job of law enforcement is to stop them doing whatever bad thing they're doing and to take them into custody and turn them over to the justice system. And obviously that's not really happening here either. And the fourth relates to what, what, what do you think when you think security? Because of the artificial separation still going on between physical security and technology, people don't expect artificial intelligence to be embedded in these products, even though they are. And they also don't understand the relationship. And this is gonna be a long repair, I think, between physical security and how much of it, how much of IT security depends on having a safe facility. And so they call it, uh, government calls it physical security. I call it facility security because I think it's easier to understand than IT security. So this is uh, one of the many shootings. We had a really busy May to June, July. And this was a Tulsa shooting where four people were killed. And so let's look at, at them and see what would have prevented this from happening. So this guy had a back operation, Mr. Lewis, and he went back and fatally shot his doctor. He shot the other doctor who was in the clinic at that time. He shot the receptionist. He shot a bystander, and then he shot himself. And this was on a, the large St. Francis Hospital campus in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And when he went back, he had to go up to the second floor to find the doctor who operated on him, Dr. Preston Phillips. And he was a, apparently a fantastic surgeon, a wonderful person. And when the shooter was released from the hospital on May 24th, the same day, he went out and bought an assault rifle from a local gun store. And then he went back a week later, took it to the hospital along with his 40 caliber Smith & Wesson semi-automatic handgun that he bought on May 29th from an area pawn shop. He went back and started shooting. So how could he just do that? Did they have any panic alarms in place? Nope, not one, nothing to call anybody or do anything except just the phone. How about the, having a receptionist? They had a receptionist that didn't prevent it from happening. He just killed the receptionist first. Was there an armed officer in the lobby? No, there was no security around then. There, maybe there was an armed office. Maybe that could have helped, but I don't know if it would have prevented it or not. I because I've seen all these other ones, I tend to think that if he shot the receptionist and he could have got the drop on the officer in the lobby, he would have killed him too. If you update the policies, take like two years to update your workplace violent policies, do you think that could have prevented this? No, I don't think so. If it was there a faster police response possible? No, I don't think so, because it took him like two minutes to get there. Was there concealed weapon screening or any kind of detection when they walked in? No. That would, that's the only thing that would have helped them, I think, get out of this, is if they had to actually go through a metal detector and they had the, a gun identified as having that gun there. This is the next one. This is uh, Encino Hospital Medical Center in Los Angeles. And this was two doctors and two nurses stabbed at this big, it's a huge, it's a huge hospital, very wealthy suburb. And so what happened to this one, this guy was walking his dog apparently and uh, having some kind of panic attack. So he just left us, he took the dog on a leash, parked his car, didn't even park his car, he just left it in the middle of the street. And he went into the emergency uh, room and he shot two people on his way in. And then he, he talked to the SWAT team for four hours while they tried to negotiate with him. He stabbed a, a doctor and two nurses and apparently one of the nurses was very badly hurt. 
and he was inside that room for hours before police finally arrested him. And again, he, one of the people who saw him there, who was an ultrasound technician, said he was covered and drenched, drenched was the word used, drenched in sweat. And also he was breathing really erratically like he was having a panic attack. And that's what he told them. When he went in, he told them that he was having a panic attack and he needed some medication and, and they didn't give any to him. So he and the other two people were stabbed. They were all sent to another hospital. And this was uh, two days after the Tulsa attack that we were talking about. So this was, uh, I haven't updated all these dates, but you can see what happened here. This, well, you can't, but I'm gonna tell you whether you wanna know or not, that, that they picked up a mental health, a person having a mental health emergency, picked him up in the ambulance, took him to the hospital on a gurney, strapped down. And as soon as they got in the hospital in Conroe, Texas, it's an HCA hospital, she pulled out a gun and started shooting. Luckily, the EMS guy was standing right by her and he disarmed her after she fired the first two shots. But again, you know, how could, how could you strap somebody down on a gurney, their arms and legs, and how can they and not check to see if they had a gun on them. So that's the amazing thing to me. Nobody did a pat down. I, they probably didn't even ask. I don't know for sure, but I think they probably didn't even ask her, you know, if they had a, if she'd had a gun or not. But she managed to, even though she was strapped down, she managed to pull it out and shoot it. And so she is already uh, arrested and charged with one count of fatal felony and one misdemeanor count of unlawfully carrying weapons in a prohibited location. And that's why it's important that you make a note that to have a, a sign, uh, a de you can buy the decals for like $35 on Amazon or anywhere you want to. And you have to have that, that decal on the front door saying weapons prohibited or no guns allowed or any, any, anything like that. But when it gets to court, as we'll talk about it will later, then when they say, you know, did you have a, uh, did you have a, was there any sign that you weren't supposed to have a gun? And they'll say no, because there wasn't anything on the door. Have the decal on the door. It has a lot of weight for these. So a lot of things that we talk about safety and security, and it seems like a lot of people think that safety and security is really about, uh, let's see, what's it doing now? Okay. Go back the other way. There we go. So a lot of things that people talk about is security and safety, which to the, uh, the un uninitiated person who's not involved in this, like I know you all are and like I am, security means that there's a guard at the door. That's it. That's all they think about security. Safety, they think that, you know, maybe there's some, you know, water detection, uh, moisture detection so that the, the IT department doesn't get flooded. That's what they think about when you talk about safety and security. So I found when talking to management about this, it's better to talk about compliance and liability, especially for healthcare with 17 kinds of providers. You have to be in compliance with all the CMS final rule on emergency preparedness that came out in about 2017. And if you're not in healthcare, the CMS is the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare. And what they do is they reimburse hospitals, hospices, dialysis centers, acute care facilities, critical care hospitals, uh, CCRCs, which are continuing care retirement communities, psychiatric hospitals, and 17 types altogether, they reimburse the procedures that they do. So they call them providers. And so that's why they have the right to, after Katrina, this is what started this whole thing, they put in real strict rules on what you have to do to be prepared for an emergency. And if you don't do that, then they close your hospital down. They can put a sign on the door that says uh, closed as of today. They've done that before a lot. If they've given you money to complete a project and you signed on the line, you attested, that's the word attested, is the CFO or the COO or the CEO or the administrator, and you attested that you were in compliance with all federal reporting requirements and they find out you didn't do this, they take the money right back out of your account. They don't tell you, they don't warn you, they don't look, they just immediately suck it back out. So it's something to be concerned about. You can also get an exclusion agreement where you're not allowed to get any money from the federal government for you personally, if you're on the board or you're an officer, or even if you're any kind of, re so if you start another company, not the one that went under, 
you start another one, you still can't get federal money ever again. So, and so everything falls back on this, what they call the general OSHA general duty clause. And it requires employers to maintain a safe environment free from recognized threats. And now it's been passed into law. So what, what it's done, I've read the new laws. There's a passed the Senate, passed the House. So it's OSHA called, this publication is called OSHA 3148. It came out in 2000 and I think 2015. And they thought it, they would immediately be able to use it, but no, they can't. So they had to change it from a requirement or a mandate to a guideline. But basically they said in the new bills that they're using exactly the same information. So that's why I'll send you a link to this too. So you can download it and see what's gonna be required now that we have this, uh, these new things happening. And uh, Tammy Baldwin from the Democratic woman from Wisconsin, she introduced the workplace violence prevention bill for healthcare and social service that, that passed in the Senate. It had passed in the House in April of 2021. So, uh, so that's passed too. So now this is gonna work. So what are the basics that you need to do to be safe? So there's a lot of things that are nice to have, but they're not gonna save a life. So what I wanna do is put something in place to save a life. And the only thing when I thought about it, and you think about it too, and see what you think, the only thing that I know that's gonna save a life is to identify the weapon and not let it get into the building. Because all these things that we talk about in every one of them, I went back and looked, almost every single one of them, it requires somebody bringing a weapon into the building. So like a Ford dealership where the guy shot his boss 70 times you know, he, he, he was allowed to walk right into the dealership without any screening. That's always the, the case. Same thing in uh, the Mercy Hospital shooting back in 2018, where the doctor had told her husband she wanted a divorce. He said he wanted it, the ring back, the, the engagement ring had given her diamond ring. So he accosted her out in the parking lot at the shift change at 3.30 in the afternoon. It says uh, in the south side of Chicago, the Mercy Hospital there and chased her around, shot her, killed her. And then because in the hospital policy, that's why policies are so weak. They, the, pos, po, the policy was to lock down the hospital so nobody could get in. Did they do that? No, they didn't. He was able to walk right back in the emergency room, sit down there and collect his thoughts for a while after killing his wife. And then he was walking down the hall and he met, killed the elevator open and two pharmacy students got out and he killed one of those. Then he looked down the hall in another direction. Here come two uh, police officers who had responded to the call for backup. And uh, he killed one of those, who had, a guy who had five children. The other guy was saved by his belt buckle. So the, if, you want to, if you want to be able to prevent these, the first thing you have to do is the annual risk assessment we'll talk about. And I still do these all the time too. And what's good about them is they're really the threat assessment part is the most interesting and also to see how many controls you have in place and it's required by CMS. So you have to do it, but basically it tells you what, what the new threats are just like today with, we're having like super hot weather all over and it's like 115 in some place in Oregon, Washington state. And that never happened before. So what they're going to expect the regulators when they come back is in six months to look at what you're doing. They're going to want to see the plan that includes something about climate change in there, something that says this is what we're going to do if it rains for 40 days and 40 nights. This is what we're going to do if it's 104 for a week, all those things. So that keeps you up to date on what's really going on. Second thing is you need full facility, you need access control. So it should be key card access control and it should be a screening in the lobby because there's, and it should be, we'll, we'll get to some other things it should be, but basically access control. So I've gone to places where uh, some of these big retirement homes, uh, CCRCs, federal designation for continuing care retirement community, where they have healthcare right there. So they, if you fall out of a tree, you go to the health center. If it gets worse, you go to the intermediate care. If it damages your brain, you end up in long-term care, but basically they promise that you'll have, live in the same place, the same house your whole life, because you have all the care right there. So, uh, but a lot of places I go to, again, they don't have those controls in place. They have certain, they have the things that they think are most important on controls and access control key cards, but they don't have them on the rest. That's a weakness of that. And if you don't have the whole thing done, it's like you're not doing anything. It's like you have nothing done. 
So I also have become a big believer in the for enforced concealed weapons screening that we'll talk about. I had never been exposed to it before, but now I've gone through the seeing the demos and how it works. And it's the only way that you're not gonna that somebody's not gonna get shot or stabbed in the in wherever you put it, emergency room, the main lobby. And when I moved to Florida, because my son had twins, so I had to move down from uh, Annapolis, Maryland. It was just amazing to me how all the Cleveland clinics down here all had screening, concealed weapon screening. Nobody else did up in the Northeast where I was doing a lot of my work, but now it's starting to change. So, and it's very inexpensive. It's like from a thousand to $1,500 to have a concealed weapon detection system right in your lobby. And you're not going to have, I remember one famous one in New York City where the city councilman, a uh, guy went to visit the city councilman who was, he was like a major donor and he didn't want to go through the x-ray machine. So the city councilman said, oh, John, come over here and walked him around the, the site of the metal scanner and boom, shot him and killed him right there, right next to it. Let him, because if you let somebody go by, we had a suicide, a nurse committed suicide in Philadelphia about a month and a half ago. And how did he get away with it? Because nobody was checking for weapons. They never do. So he was able to walk in with his gun, go to the emergency room and kill himself right in front of everybody. So uh, armed officer in the lobby 24 seven, that's nice if you can afford it, but you don't have to have it because the, the weapon screening will automatically notify everybody in the universe if there's a weapon detected and it'll even pull up a man trap and, and take the person who got caught and isolate them so they cannot go out, lock the door so they can't get out of the room that they're in or even have a cage around them. So uh, having an armed officer probably helps if it becomes very expensive when it's 365 days a year and 24 hours a day. The other one that I think it just because I've had so many bad experiences lately is you have to secure all the doors. You, yes, you have to have a single entrance or you have to have two places to scan and you have to have severe penalties for propping open the doors because I, everywhere I go, I see propped open doors. In fact, one place where I was in Los Angeles a couple of weeks ago, I asked if I could get a cup of coffee where the cafeteria was and they said, oh, honey, you can't. The cafeteria is closed. Why is it closed? A rat infestation. Because apparently when you leave the door propped open, not only can people walk in the back door and you get those nice breezes from outside, but the rats, all they do is see a big open for business sign and they go swarming in and theirs was so bad they had to shut down the whole cafeteria for two weeks to get the rats out. So I think there should be severe penalties for coming in at doors. And if you think about it, how many they mentioned the doors are main problem in Uvalde. There were a problem here in Parkland, that's where I live, right across the street from the school, just so I don't forget. So these are the some kind of different controls, access control, having an area of refuge to hide from an active shooter. You know, that's required. I don't want to do that. I want to stop the shooter before he gets there. I don't know how many people have uh, seen the movie Deja Vu, but Denzel Washington's a hero in that movie. And he says he's the ATF officer inv investigating the bombing at the Algiers Ferry Bridge in New Orleans. And he's saying, all my life, I've been showing up here to look at something and figure out how they did it after it's already, something horrible has already happened. Just once, I'd like to get out in front and be there before something horrible happens. That's how I feel. I'm tired of telling everybody, you know, yeah, you could do this or this or this. I'm going to tell you, you need to do concealed weapons detection screening. And that way you're sure that nobody's letting guns and knives into that building. So uh, I'll show you how easy that is too in a minute. Uh, disaster recovery plans. Again, it's, they're, they're important in, in case of a flood or some horrible natural disaster, they're really, really important. But again, they can, you can have a perfect disaster recovery plan and people can, if people can walk up to this, walk in the lobby, walk up to the second floor and get the elevator or the 12th floor, whatever, you're not getting anywhere. You're still gonna have these same shootings over and over and over again. Mass emergency notification systems that helps great after it already happened or while it's happening. But again, that's been, uh, I think that's one control that almost everybody has now. Updating your emergency plan frequently, updating your policies and procedures. 
nice to have, very helpful in certain situations, but they're, they're no substitute for actually keeping the concealed weapons out of your That's the most important thing to do. And so we're going to have some webinars next week about what happened in Uvalde. Basically, they quit. The chief of police showed up without his radio, stopped treat, treated the incident as a ballistic incident, not as an active shooter situation. He didn't. He said he didn't know there were children inside the classrooms, which really strains credibility. But and this is the uh, SBI special agent who created the active shooter program for the FBI after Sandy Hook. She wrote a book, Stop the Killing, How to End the Mass Shooting Crisis. And uh, she also said it was just absolutely horrible, the worst, worst response she have ever seen. So again, they had all the bad hallmarks. They had the, it can't happen here attitude. I don't know if you saw the TV when it first happened. Everybody was going, we're such a close-knit community. Everybody knows everybody. And they didn't even, they actually had uh, updated policies and procedures, but obviously they didn't follow them. You know, there was no social media interest in investigating the shooter Ramos. No warning after he shot his grandmother in the face with neighbors outside and stole her truck to go to shoot up the school. Nobody called the police. Nobody said anything. Nobody wanted to get involved. Commander on the scene didn't get notified that 911 calls were still coming from the children in the classroom who were bleeding out with almost 400 police, 368 policemen right outside the door. They didn't allow the first responders in to stop the bleed. There was no case management. It was, it was public, it, how bad he was, and nobody even picked up on it. And again, there's no accountability. They're still arguing about whether he should get dismissed or not. So there have to be consequences for these things, and they have to be tough. If you want to stop the killing, got to have tough consequences. So uh, continuing problem again. And this was after the Alina shooting uh, last in 2021. Violence in healthcare settings happens every day on every shift and in all units of the hospital. On the day of the shooting, the nurses union set a press release citing its own 2019 survey saying 95% of the nurses say they don't feel safe from violence at work. And that's worldwide too. It's not just in the United States. So why is it still happening? One thing is revenue problems after the last recession have uh, constrained hospital spending and prevented some from putting in needed controls. But again, you don't have to put them all in. You just have to put one in that's going to alert you to a gun. There's still the disturbing, it can't happen here mentality. And many of administrators I found that I've actually met in person, they're not aware of these fines. They're not aware that they could be shut down. They don't know that they'll never get federal money again. They don't understand what wrongful death lawsuits are. And almost everybody, every family who has a, a family member who gets shot or injured is gonna file a wrongful death lawsuit or an injury lawsuit. And these things are now required. Five years ago, they weren't, now they are. Now CMS requires them. So there's gonna be huge penalties for these hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so we've been uh, working with this company called Athena Security. It's a relatively new company. It has people who were doing AI work in another kind of security. And they just started this about three months ago. It's already the number one uh, concealed weapons screening system. It's the only one that meets federal standards. That's part of it. It's the only one that allows three to five thousand three to five thousand people an hour just walk through it. And it's not like the like the airport. You don't have to take off your shoes. You don't have to put your keys away. You don't you can leave your phone in your pocket. And again, it's very affordable. And we also have a couple of pilot programs. If anybody's interested, you can email me later. My uh, information will be on the screen. Right now, the way it is now, over 40, 50% of hospitals do no weapon screening at all ever. And every time I walk into a security officer's office, what do I see? I see the, I recognize the cardboard box that they, when they went and bought a, a wand, you know, to take and wand people for, and call that metal screening. When somebody looks suspicious, they want them, you know, like ridiculous. And the other thing is it's still in the box. They probably never even used it. So that doesn't count in the kind of screening we're talking about. The other is to show management the return on investment of weapon screening. It also cuts down on security officer requirements because as we talked about, you don't have to have somebody there, you know, every minute, every minute, 24 hours a day, because this thing is gonna, wow. One of our, uh, one of our, one of the people who were on here, 
said he was one of the first responders at Sandy Hook. Wow, could you answer this question? Could you li be live and participate, do you think? I don't know. I, I've never had anybody tell me that before. And uh, a Stacy Porter, who's a friend of mine on this call also, leakage of violence is what these shooters exhibit. They don't just snap. That's just right, like we were talking about before. Anyway, uh, okay. questions and answers. So next, I'm gonna talk about the risk assessment, why it's so important, but I have running out of time. So I've gotta do this pretty quick, but basically the whole point of it, and that's when I moved to Washington DC, 1990, Standard methodology has been customized for high value critical assets. And if you, if a hospital is anything, it's a high value critical asset. It has equipment, it has a facility, it has patients, it has people, it runs 24 hours a day as a credible high value and incredibly critical assets. So that's something that, you know, we look at. And so how do we, how do you talk to management to explain to them why they need this? because you take the initial cost of how much the control costs, how much it costs to maintain every year over its life cycle, the value of the asset that it's protecting, the likelihood of a specific threat occurring, which comes with your threat assessment as part of your risk assessment, that tells you exactly how much, how much you're going to lose if something happens to that. Like in the Oklahoma City bombing, we were able to establish that a third of the replacement cost of the building was lost in that bombing. And then we calculate the return on investment by using the likelihood, the average uh, occurrence of a threat using five different, five different data points, including in getting from the controller, the value of that asset that we're protecting. And then we can calculate the return on investment or the bang for the buck, how much can we do? So what we wanna do, it's a ratio. So if it's like one to three million, that's for every dollar you spend, you save three million dollars by not having a, a, a lawsuit. Same thing. So we can apply this to to the purchase of a weapon detection system because it, it's so inexpensive that any it would protect against all the things that are expensive about having an incident. And of course, it's required to to do the assessment every year for CMS. And first thing you do is update all your threat data and we blend industry data with your local incident data, your local incident reports. Then we identify the criticality of the assets. We survey the staff to see how compliant they are with the current requirements and how much knowledge they have about everything, the training, how to use the emergency equipment, everything. Then analyze and rate the implementation of all the potential controls. And that's how we get to a calculation it says this is the cheapest thing you can do and it's gonna give you the most protection. And we talked about updating the emergency based on, especially on environmental things, heat, cold, floods, all those things, rapid sea level rise in, in Miami now. Go, I went down there during Hurricane Irma and it, the, the, the water, it looked like a river running through the back of the hospital. It was, it was as high as the loading dock. The, you could walk out of the river into the loading dock basically. And that's going to continue. It's not going away. Same thing for changes in uh, changes in crime data for something for something else happens there that uh, causes crime problem. Could be change in a law. Could be anything else. But basically, can communicate internally with the mass notification system. It's also a CMS requirement to warn the entire staff not to come in the lobby at eight o'clock in the morning if you're having an active shooter incident there. And also in the, instantly warn the ambulance companies, the state, local, federal agencies, and all the other healthcare providers there. So the biggest cost of all this is probably wrongful death. So that's what we want to avoid. So here we're saying we're, these are things that have been settled in the last couple of years. McDonald's uh, lost a lawsuit, had to pay $27 million for two kids killed at fighting in their parking lot. U.S. Security Associates, uh, was sued for $64 million, but the Kraft Cracker Factory lawsuit where they make goldfish crackers in Philadelphia, they lost the suit. The security guys ran away and hid in the boiler room, cast iron boiler room. And the lady went out to her car, got her gun, came back and killed the three people who'd, who'd fired her. Stanford Health, $82 million lawsuit, wrongful death lawsuit. 
after a woman, older woman got in the car, stepped on the brake, stepped on the gas instead of the brake, ran over the director of Lawrence Livermore Labs, lost the lawsuit. And just in a, a very standard one, Del Nor Hospital south of uh, Chicago, four nurses received almost $8 million for being traumatized and raped by a patient who the guard uh, took the handcuffs off because he said he couldn't go to the bathroom with the handcuffs on and grabbed the nurses, took the gun, you know, this is about, you can read about that when I send you the slides. So it also affects your state funding and county funding, uh, reputation, everything, and millions of dollars in liability. The one in Las Vegas where they shot out in the crowd was a $800 million settlement in the lawsuit to cover all those people, almost a billion dollars for wrongful death lawsuits. So you have to explain how the assessment is, it's gotta be done correctly so it actually protects you. But if it's protected and done, then it can insulate you from, from monetary fines and, and all sorts of terrible things. So, uh, you know, that's a good thing. Hey, Brian, I should talk to you. He's, he says he's in Florida. I see the chat's inactive, but so we can use the Q&A. Prior to coming to Fort Myers, Florida, he said he worked for Yale New Haven Hospital. I worked for New Yale New Haven Hospital too. I worked for them for three years with uh, uh, Marvin White and uh, did a bunch of risk assessments on the different parts of their hospitals and most major disasters, like you said, that happened since 2005. That's a really nice hospital. So this is how we calculate our return on investment. And so we take how much it would, they would lose if one of these things happened, one of these threats and the panic alarm. Does it stop an active shooter? No, but it might reduce a homicide by 10% by getting uh, help there faster. Door alarms reduces homicide by 10%. Concealed weapons reduces by 20% to 40%. And so again, the potential loss is 40% of the $300 million. So that's how we get to these different calculations. And so what you're doing is you're creating a continuous cycle of improvement. You find something, you report it, you update your threats every year, you identify the asset criticalities, what's critical, survey the staff to see where they're doing, evaluate the controls and see how much you're implemented. And then for the next year, you implement those. And they don't even care if you implement them all at one time. You can spread them out over three years and say, okay, the first year, we're going to, first quarter, we're going to add five panic alarms. Second quarter, we're going to add 10, five more. Every quarter this year, we're going to add five more until we get every single person who needs a panic alarm will have one. Then we aggregate all the threat data for ever, with ever. So here we have five points for assault. How often it occurs right here in Yale New Haven Hospital, I'll say five times a year. Industry data, same five times a year. Uniform crime index, it's near uh, Hartford. So uh, 12, 12 for incident report on the crime scale adds up to 22, divide by three data points. And it comes out to about seven times a year that they, they have a assault, report of assault. So this is the Athena entryway system that you can put out in your lobby. It integrates with RFID so it can identify any employee instantly, ma maintains the highest possible traffic flow to avoid lines. And you can, it also has, because it has a computer as part of it, can instantly lock down the whole hospital. So you don't have these guys killing people in the parking lot then going back in the emergency room door and killing more people. And you can all, and this is what it looks like. So this is about 40 inches apart, these two pillars. And we can even make a banner for you with the name saying, welcome to Alina, welcome to Cleveland Clinic. So three to 4,000 people can go through in an hour and they can be listening to their headphones, wearing their backpack, keys in their, and cell phone in their pocket. And then here we have the driver of this whole thing and it's going to record everything too. So you have a visual record of every single thing that happened. And it can also pull up a man trap in another model, it can pull up a man trap around to isolate somebody, it can lock all the doors in the room where you set it up. And we want it in the lobby. And it also detects more concealed weapons than any other screening system. And it's the only one that meets a federal standard. So those are, those are all good reasons to think about it. So, or to use it. So. Yeah, you should uh, take a look at the at the Athena system too, Brian. 
and uh, yeah, let me know where you are, and I can have they can come. They'll come up and set up a trail for you too, so you can see how it works. But basically, uh, it it also detects ferrous metal, which is iron, but also non-ferrous metal. The other ones only collect uh, can identify the ferrous metal components. But uh, I think it, it I think it'll work for you. These are the measuring controls by the uh, return on investment, the return on investment chart that it's going to give you. So every one of these is a ratio. Do we need more security staff? Yes. It's the first thing here. One to 15,000 to one. That means for every dollar you spend on that security staff, you're saving $15,000 for every dollar. Same thing. Water drainage and alarms, water supplies, security officers, fire alarms, disaster recovery plan, all these things. And so the bottom line is it going to guarantee compliance and reduce liability, prevent these incidents before they happen, and don't wait on passive controls. Talk to management tomorrow about what you need to secure your facility and tell them that the threat is getting worse every single day with the election coming up and everything. Lack of security, a judge said, is not an effective legal argument after an active shooter event, so you're not going to get any relief from the courts. So the best thing to do is start analyzing your current access control systems and concealed weapon detection screening system, because that's what's going to save lives. And again, active shooter it gives you the best bang for the buck, the risk assessment, it tells you what you need to do, and then you can, uh, you can get the solutions you need in place. So this is, uh, this is, I'm Caroline, this is my email address. My phone number is 301. 346-9055. And I'm going to call you tomorrow, Brian. I think I have your phone number someplace. And if, uh, please send me an email with it in case I don't have it, because I want to talk to you about Yale University. And this is Michael Green. He's the CEO of Athena Security. And he's been working with me uh, to, to show people how well this entryway system works and how easy it is. We actually had it set up at the IAHSS show in Reno. We'll have it set up. We're going to be at the Reno sh at the IAHSS show in Myrtle Beach at the end of August, and so hopefully you can come to that. If you haven't been to an IAHSS show before, it's the International Association of Safety and Security. So uh, it's a it's a great show, and Myrtle Beach is a wonderful place. I'll just say. So if anybody has any questions, you can uh, do it right now. And uh, you can ask me any questions that you have, and I'd be really happy to answer them or uh, help you with anything else that you need. And I want to thank you very much. I'll also be in upstate New York in the middle of October at a Turning Stone Casino up there. They're having a big show of all the healthcare officers in New York, New York State, Central New York State. And I, they're one of my clients. I'm going to be going and working with them up there too. So hopefully I'll see you sometime soon or talk to you. And I really appreciate you coming for the, I know we got the time is out a little late. I really appreciate the interest. And just remember, if you want to save lives, the way to do it is, is screen these weapons before they get in your facility. Have a great time and feel free to contact me. Bye-bye.